Good morning, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Lou Feldman, thank you for the invitation to uh, kind of show you where we have uh, started in the revitalization of US Highway 50, where we're headed, and um, I'm pleased to be accompanied by John Hester from TRPA and Carl Hasty from the TTD. Um, a team presentation. So um, I'm going to give the historical background because I think I'm the oldest member of the team. Um, and uh, Mr. Hester is going to be more in the land use uh, uh, moving forward process. Um, and uh, Carl is here to help with any questions that may arise. Um, this is actually um, <clears throat> um, really exciting. It, some of you um, weren't born yet, I suspect, but in the late or mid-80s, the city of South Lake Tahoe engaged a design group from San Francisco called the Roma Design Group. And the Roma Design Group was um, commissioned to try and formulate a redevelopment plan, and that redevelopment plan had something uh, that, that uh, harkens to the weight room. It was a barbell approach to um, land use. And the barbell approach that was um, adopted by the city back in the 80s was an anchor at ski run and an anchor at state line. Those were the barbells and then infill in between. Um, since that time, a lot has occurred. And, and the, the concept of this was uh, spine, anchors, connectivity. So that's kind of the, the satellite view and what's depicted in the slide. In addition, you know, we, we've kind of moved that out now because we've gone beyond the state line and we've gone to the intersection at Lake Parkway and Highway 50, so the barbell has gotten heavier, we've gotten stronger, we have more to lift, a heavy lift. Um, we're going to go back now to Ski Run Boulevard and see where we were and, and where we have uh, evolved, and as you're looking down at, at this slide, the upper slide depicts what was the um, Kentucky Fried Chicken Corner, for lack of a better word. That was a, a <laughs> property owned by uh, Rudy Gersick, uh, who was one of the founders of Heavenly Valley, by the way. And uh, Rudy, uh, um, who has uh, moved on to greener pastures, may he rest in peace, uh, was um, determined to redevelop that corner. And one of the things that you know is evident when you look at uh, the before and after is you know, we didn't develop in the most, you know, architecturally stunning uh, um, format. We were uh, developed as a response to, I think, what we might say was a virtual monopoly on gaming. We had the Squaw Valley Olympics, and we had a, a burst of development that, um, in fairness, was uh, low quality and um, did not respect the natural wonder that we are blessed to live within. So as we start moving from ski run towards state line, uh, what you see other than an 18 wheeler in the lower slide, in the upper slide, uh, you know, that was the uh, state of the state. Um, we were strip motels, single loaded corridors, virtually no landscaping, a lot of surface parking, and you know, quite frankly, no awareness of the impacts of surface runoff off of all of these hard services, surfaces to the quality, water quality of Lake Tahoe. And in the lower slide, uh, what you see are the, um, somewhat obstructed by the large vehicle, are the um, wildwood basins. And these basins were pioneering in their day. This is low impact development where we have captured thousands and thousands of pounds of sediment and nutrients before it enters Lake Tahoe, and not only have we created terif terrific water quality enhancements, but we've created some visual relief from what um, some might fairly characterize as blight. Um, again, moving from uh, west to east, um, we are looking at uh, kind of linear parkway opposite what was uh, what is Tahoe Meadows, and obviously transit is something that we are trying to promote and enhance. Um, but this slide to me is uh, um, particularly compelling because when you look in the upper right-hand side um, where you see vehicles parked where they shouldn't be parked on you know, dirt, you also see uh, what did not seem to me to be 
a particularly friendly introduction to the downtown area, a chain-linked barbed wire fence protecting the inhabitants of Tahoe Meadows from the great unwashed. Um, yeah, so what could be less friendly than that kind of you know, prison-type frontage? Uh, well, more friendly is the other side of the street, but perhaps not a great upgrade. So you know, we had virtually no sidewalks, a proliferation of signage, and um, what we were able to do at Tahoe Meadows through redevelopment in the city's leadership was a fairly stunning part of this barbell concept, this connectivity. And so we have this linear park. I, I think Tahoe Meadows would agree their frontage has been dramatically enhanced. And now Ski Run and the core are, are experiencing some pretty high utilization, pedestrian, bicycle, and most recently, the Phenomena Lime Scooter. Um, again, moving more towards state line. Uh, on the left-hand side of the street uh, was the uh, red carpet inn. And uh, just beyond that, if some of you can remember, was the 400-unit Lake Tahoe Inn. And virtually no sidewalks, well, no sidewalks at all, actually, and no curb and gutter. Our stormwater management was you know, just watered running down the street. Um, our uh, <coughs> pedestrian amenities might best be characterized as a garbage pail. And uh, we had some A-frame signs. And we actually had um, some landscape. We had a couple of barrels and some petunias. Um, not a particularly pretty picture. Uh, this was uh, pretty emblematic of hundreds of units that uh, predominated what is now Heavenly Village. Uh, very small motel units and people that were coming in those days predominantly were coming to game. They were not coming to recreate and they needed a place to shower and sleep briefly before they went back to the casinos. Um, our um, architectural centerpiece was Cecil's Market um, and um, Cecil's Market actually had dormers and a pitched roof distinguishing itself from almost all other of our built environment. Um, and of course, you can see uh, Heavenly in the background. And it looks pretty much the same today with lots of snow. And that's a wonderful thing. So the before and after at that corner, I think, tells the story. Um, what we now have is um, a, a pretty remarkable um, built environment that, was, that catalyzed change in this community. So Heavenly Village with outdoor dining, food and beverage, um, connectivity, again, we brought the mountain to the bed base. There are 5,000 rooms within walking distance of the gondola. And this was a public-private partnership that I think we can all be proud of. This changed the dynamic. We are no longer a gaming-centric economy. We are a family-friendly destination. And recreation and entertainment are, you know, where we have transitioned. Um, our landscaping is somewhat enhanced over the prior iteration. And then we looked at the other side of the street. So we did the, the mountain side of Highway 50. And with uh, redevelopment, we took a look at the lake side of Highway 50. And that's Project 3. And so as you look at the upper slide, that was the pre-existing condition. And as I think uh, most of you that were here know, you could probably find any t-shirt in the universe <laughs> along the strip on uh, the lakeside of Highway 50. And then the after image, again, introduces this alpine architecture. Um, what we're trying to do is you know, fit in our natural environment as best we can. We're using natural materials. We're using real wood. We're using real rock. And we have these great landscape parkways, again, creating better pedestrian and multimodal experiences. And we wanted to continue that, of course, to the state line. And um, there have been some um, casualties along the way. Uh, Taco Bell isn't there anymore, uh, nor is the Union 76. And our wildlife exhibit at the La Bear Motel, consisting of a black bear and a, and a um, polar bear, are just fond memories. And 
so the next phase, a little out of sequence, but uh, is the chateau, and this is the retail um, and some food and beverage that now is on the California side of the state line, certainly transforming the downtown experience, and I, I think you know creating a built environment in an alpine setting that is worthy of its surroundings. We are still, of course, bisected by a five-lane U.S. highway, and that's presented some obstacles. So as you get to the state line, um, nothing really has changed. We have um, a fairly sterile environment. Uh, we have this fencing that uh, I guess is a safety feature, um, but uh, th this is 1970s casino, almost museum quality development where the idea was no transparency, no windows, no interactive capability with the um, pedestrian environment. You know, don't let anybody know what time of day it is, just keep them imprisoned in these four walls. Um, we have a little bit of relief as you get a little closer to the loop road, but really no fundamental change. And so what we're hoping is that this revitalization that California has really pioneered uh, can help, you know, uh, the community, because the community is, doesn't end at the state line. And it's noteworthy, excuse me, I'll take that. No. Um, it's noteworthy that, you know, part of the regional plan update in 2012, you know, w was a, 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 a major shift in the thinking of TRPA, where TRPA as a land use organization was really growth control on steroids. And it was against, you know, some people may argue this, but change was very difficult to negotiate with TRPA. Their commodity system was very constricting. And they realized that um, we are fundamentally built out. And so if we want to achieve environmental gain, we need to redevelop, and redevelop results in water quality benefits, air quality benefits. And in that regard, when the 2012 regional plan was adopted, there was a, a seismic shift at TRPA where the cornerstone of that philosophy had changed to environmental redevelopment. And so this citation, which is hardly very sexy, um, is important because it was adopted to allow the interior retail and food and beverage uses in the casino core to come forward to the street without commercial floor area to try and animate the street and create, again, that kind of connectivity and activity and pedestrian-friendly presence, which of course is sorely lacking. And so TRPA is trying to incentivize positive change which again is a you know, huge step forward. So th these are images of you know, what might happen in the core as the South Shore revitalization project continues to evolve and certainly nobody's advocating this is the end product, it's just an idea, an idea to inspire other ideas. And so we have an opportunity, particularly with the narrowing of Highway 50 in the core, to have a little more geography to respond to pedestrian and other multimodal opportunities and create a much more dynamic and pedestrian friendly downtown core in addition to looping the uh, roadway to the backside of Rayleigh's and the casino core. And this is an indication of what the new Highway 50 could look like with, again, sidewalks, bicycle lanes, sound walls, landscaping, and also a pedestrian bridge that would connect um, the bed base to Van Sickle State Park, and as I think most of you are aware, the, the park is in the process of constructing the Greenway uh, connectivity to Myers. Uh, what a fabulous addition to our recreational mix. And again, looking from the bridge, you can see the gondola in the distance, and you know, this is a pretty cool pedestrian amenity, and a, 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 I think kind of a there there. Um, another piece of this equation may be, um, an event center on the corner of Lake Parkway and US Highway 50, which is now before TRPA for approval. It would seat 6,000 people. It would be year-round opportunity for entertainment, uh, performing arts, community events, and creates the anchor now at the loop road side. So again, the connectivity, spine, anchors. And this could be, 
uh, what the gateway to the core could look like coming from the Nevada side. So um, the current plan has a um, roundabout. This landscaped roundabout certainly can have a fairly compelling presence. And you can see the event center uh, replacing what was surface parking um, at the um, Mount Blue. Um, so that concludes uh, my team effort. And I'm pleased to introduce John Hester, who is going to be able to walk you through some of the land use and planning context in more detail and the opportunities, I think, arising from what we all now call the Main Street Management Plan. I appreciate your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Welcome, Mr. Hasty. Mr. Hester. Sorry. That's OK. Don't be hasty. Carl's the gray one. <laughs> Uh, I know you're a tough crowd because when former Mayor Davis was walking up here, I think it was his son, said, don't blow it. So uh, I'll try not to. Anyway, I get to uh, take the, Lou took the walk down memory lane. I'll try to take, get you some, uh, give you some vision of where this can go in the future. And uh, I get to put my planning geek, uh, I, have, I was a, I have an undergraduate degree in architecture and a graduate degree in city and regional planning. And in between there is a field called urban design, which is what this is all about, which I, what I really wanted to do, and it's only taken me 40 years to get here. So I'm gonna put on my planning geek hat and talk about some of these concepts, but I, I think it's important to reiterate this spine and core concept because it's something that uh, underlies what we're trying to do and has for years. So. The idea of a spine is that it connects, as Lou said, anchors. It's the uh, oftentimes the center of a community, uh, and it also has links coming off of it to important places. So let me give you some examples of those. Uh, probably the best known spine and corridor system or setup in this country is the National Mall. Obviously, the anchors are things like the monuments, the White House, the Capitol. And you've got all of these Smithsonian uh, facilities around it. And it, it's probably the easiest to grasp example of a built out spine and corridor concept. Uh, you, may have, you may have been to San Antonio and they're probably world famous uh, river walk. It's the same thing built around a natural feature. Uh, what was a natural feature actually, that's a river meander now that's bypassed by a flood project, but they kept it because there's all of these facilities and, and amenities built around it. It has a convention center, it has hotels, it has a lot of the restaurants, a lot of the same things that we're talking about here. Uh, this, is this is Denver, 16th Street Transit Mall, which also has a lot of similarities, and I'll focus a little bit on it, but at one end of, of the 16th Street Transit, and it used to be a street, uh, one end of it is the Capitol, and the other end is the old Union Station, railroad station. It has, it started in the 80s, and uh, since it's been built out, a lot of new facilities have been added to it, and it connects to Cherry Creek. So I'll give you an example on the spine, the top th uh, three pictures, what that shows is what it's like on that corridor now. It's very active, very vibrant, uh, a lot goes on. The anchors on the, in the middle, on the left side is the, uh, capital of Colorado in Denver. The, the middle is the Union, old Union Station I mentioned. Both ends of those are now served by mass transit, uh, rapid transit, the light rail system that goes all over the region. You can see those kind of modern looking uh, canopies. Those are where the trains come in. The things it connects to uh, on the bottom left, that's the old Larimer Square historic area. Uh, the arts and culture facilities in the middle and the new Denver or Colorado Convention Center that was built uh, next to it. So you see a lot of similarities uh, and what's I think most exciting to me is you look at the before and after. Not a lot of people would like to be uh, on the left and, and on the right you can see what a, a more pleasing environment that is. Uh, closer to home, one that I got to work on uh, is the Reno Riverfront. If you think about a mall with anchors and people go between all of those anchors, that was the concept we had in Reno with uh, the Truckee River. And the Truckee River in the 80s, the city had turned its back to it. And now it has a number of anchors and connections. And I'll give you some of the same kind of pictures. The spine is along the river. And now there's kayaking there, dining, uh, all kinds of events. The anchors are, include an amphitheater, 
the city plaza where if you want to go be political, uh, you can show up for uh, marches. And of course, the baseball stadium, uh, AAA baseball stadium. It's connected a couple blocks from the Nevada Museum of Art, a couple more blocks to the north to the event center and, and uh, ballroom, and by shuttle to the University of Nevada campus. Uh, a few other examples before I leave this concept, but I think you, you all have it, is in Livermore. They, again, sounds very familiar. They realigned a four-lane state highway, converted the state highway to a two-lane street that's sort of the middle of the community, and you can see the street is actually convertible to outdoor dining, as you can see. Uh, Carson City, Nevada, recently completed their project, uh, and, and it's starting to get a lot more active uh, restaurants and businesses are opening on that corridor. So I think you get the point of the spine and corridor and what it can do at different scales. Um, so looking at our main street here, uh, this, think of this as a palette. People said, well, what, what could we do here? Well, you, you can do any mix or match of these things. Starting with uh, top left, a minor change is just pavement condition. That lets people know that this is a different place. You can also extend the curbs out, narrow the street, and do stormwater facilities. This is an example. Wider sidewalks like already have happened on the California side. Diagonal parking. And then I wanted to show you on the uh, right side is diagonal parking where they can move in portable dining units. So we have the seasons here, so we have the option of saying, well, maybe we want diagonal parking in front of some of our stores. When it's not nice outside, when it is, maybe we want to move in street dining. Uh, you have mobile barriers that you can put up and take down. Uh, the one in the uh, second from the bottom on the left is rising bollards, which means you can pull those up for an event or take them down if you want to open up a street. There, now, with the technology these days, you can have emergency vehicles or transit vehicles or whatever uh, so that when the, the bollards are up, when they show up, they go down to let them through. Uh, you have fixed bollards, and then, of course, uh, this is an example of uh, Boulder, Colorado, pedestrian mall. So we have all of these things uh, that are a palette, and what's uh, really exciting to me is in this day and age, you don't have to pick one. You have flexibility to have them change throughout the year. If we want to create a space, we can close it for an event. If we want to open it back up for parking or through traffic or bicycles or whatever, we have all of these options, we have a wonderful opportunity here to create something that is probably the leading edge in terms of these public spaces. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Lou mentioned the uh, plans done in 2011 uh, for the vision of the South Shore. A lot of, when I first got here, right as the regional plan was getting developed, I asked, what is the vision? And this is a graphic, I know you can't read all the details, but it was, Really what we're talking about is connecting the mountain to this core and then to the lake and then all kinds of different ways to get around. Transit, bicycles, cars, all of that. You can see that same barbell concept that Lou was talking about that you all had the vision to put in place back in the 80s. So this is carrying this out with a lot of different types of amenities and uh, creating quite a, a, a space, a world-class space for this world-class environment we live in. Uh, you have since adopted an area plan, as has Douglas County. Both of those recognize the need to take this core area further and, and the South Shore Community Revitalization Plan. So uh, moving forward in November, the TRPA permitted the project that TTD brought to us, uh, and it has a number of components, the South Shore Community Revitalization Project. I wish, Carl, you had come up with a shorter name, but... Uh, that's what it is, it's, it's SSCRP. Um, so it has a number of components and conditions that I will go through so you all and the public know where we are and what we expect. And so let me go through each one of these pieces. Um, here's, wh here's what they are written down and who's the lead entity. As Lou mentioned, the Main Street Management Plan, which we are starting the process of now, and I, I applaud you for having a meeting in March where the community is invited to uh, express for you all what they want to see as this goes forward. Replacement housing, parking management, transit and circulator, all of the Rocky Point neighborhood plan, and then that moves, sets up the engineering and actual construction of the new 50. Uh, of course, there's the funding requirement that we are all working on. 
Uh, but let me go through each one of these to try to help you understand a little bit more about those. So the Main Street Management Plan, Lou already showed you what the existing streetscape is on the California side. The idea, as he mentioned, is what does that look like as it extends over to the Nevada side? And, and specifically, what kind of circulation is there going to be for pedestrians, bicycles, scooters, transit, and, and vehicles? We also uh, required a wayfinding system. So if you get there, say, and park in a parking garage and want to get to uh, a certain facility, there's a wayfinding system. We also uh, required that uh, how this is going to be owned, managed, and fund, funded gets worked out and uh, then standards to, and, and monitoring systems so that to see if it's working, if it's doing what we set, thought it would do when the plan was developed. Housing, uh, TTD has committed to and we've required uh, that they replace 76 units before they do anything, uh, any construction at all, uh, and take anybody out of the houses they're in. Um, we've also required another 33 after the fact, so there's a uh, and there's even an option to go beyond that. These are the sites that have been identified by TTD. Uh, parking management, if you, I know you've probably been to parking garages where there's different floors and it tells you how many spaces. If you take that to a larger scale and say, where are the different lots and garages? How many are available to each one? And you have signage or you even have it on your app or even in fight with 5G, it maybe even shows up on your little screen in your car. Here's where you can go park. It works to get people to parking better. It also works for the parking facility owner. So that's something that, uh, that we want to see get done. And part of, part of what we expect is people will come to this core area, park once, and then get around by foot, transit, or on bike. So we think it'll be a, a great environmental improvement, air quality-wise. We've also required transit and a circulator, so trans regular transit into and out of this core area, as well as a circulator within, particularly when there's uh, events and, and those kind of things to help with that park once and get around concept. We've also required that the uh, TTD work with the Rocky Point neighborhood so that they can come up with an amenities plan on how that integrates into the changed core. Uh, some of the concepts they're looking at are a neighborhood park, uh, improved pedestrian facilities, sidewalks, transit stops, uh, connection to the uh, shopping center, those kind of things. Uh, this is the actual layout of the f of this highway realignment that was approved as part of the uh, permit. And uh, the engineering work for that will go on and then the project can actually, this part of the project can actually happen after the other things occur. So I wanna point out the phasing that is in the permit TRPA gave to TTD. Um, so they've got a phase one permit that's conditional, essentially. Uh, it hasn't been acknowledged yet, to use the TRPA terminology. Before it can be acknowledged, the replacement housing must be permitted and built. The Main Street Management Plan must be developed and, and approved, and the Rocky Point Amenities Plan must be completed. So all of that has to happen before anything ever happens with moving the highway and rebuilding Main Street. Uh, then phase one gets acknowledged in the and the highway part gets built. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about what the Main Street Management Plan is. I've <clears throat> already given you a little bit about what we, the kinds of things we could see, but we wanted to actually turn that vision into what is gonna re really be there in the process, enhance, enhancing the environment for everybody. And like, like I just said, it's a condition or a component of the South Shore Community Revitalization Project. This is the area, it's the what will be the former 50 corridor and all of the properties that abut it. Uh, so that's the area that it will be covering. Uh, we've taken a work plan to the TRPA board in January that lays out the process, the participants, those kind of things. It has a phase one and two that we hope to, uh, phase one we hope to complete this month, which is just background data, getting the stakeholder working group set up and those sort of things. Uh, and then phase, Two will be actually getting a plan done over the the schedule is the remainder of this calendar year. Phases three and four are: Will there need to be changes to TRPA's code? Will there need to be other things that happen in implementation? We've recognized that may happen, need to happen, but that will be after the plan is done. Um, 
and I'm not going to talk about the public input and outreach yet because I've got a slide on that. <coughs> Our timeline I just kind of described. You can see um, phase two is just beginning, phase one is just ending. And I will talk about the dates for those meetings and so forth. Uh, important part are who is involved and what roles do they have. There's a staff steering committee, your city manager, the New Douglas County manager, Mr. Hasty and myself will be that, that group of staff that are working together and deciding a lot of things like what goes on the next agenda, working together on the consultant, uh, all of those kind of things. So at the, at the staff level, you will be an integral, your, your city manager will be an integral part of directing how this project, this planning process folds, unfolds. Um, there's a technical working group that is being led and convened by TTD. It is all of the folks, I'm sure Mr. Jarvis knew, already knows he's going to get tapped for this, but uh, it will be all of the people who understand the technical issues and the infrastructure and safety and all of those kinds of issues that we need to be aware of before we start designing something. Last thing we want to do is, is put something on top of a vault that might blow up. Not that that would ever happen, but uh, it, we, we don't want to do those kind of things. Uh, and then the most important, in my opinion, is, is kind of the policy group, the group that will recommend the plan. Uh, this is what we call the stakeholder working group, and that will include um, a, a representative from the city, uh, representatives from all these organizations. I think ultimately you'll probably end up with a couple council members on this group. Um, and it will be chaired by uh, two TRPA board members. And then the, the process over this uh, phase two starting up this month is uh, these different are the stages in the planning process. Every one of these meetings is a public meeting. We plan to have two uh, public open houses where we spend time and this is in addition to the one you have scheduled for March 14th, where we spend time getting into details and getting feedback from, from everybody who wants to participate. Uh, this just to illustrate that there will be feedback at every step of the way. The staff steering committee I mentioned with the city manager on it, technical working group, uh, which is the, the folks that are providing the safety and the infrastructure and that sort of information. Stakeholder working group will recommend the plan. And once the plan's recommended, our plan is to then bring it to you, bring it to the Douglas County Board, and take it to the TTD, TTD Board for endorsement before it goes back to the TRPA Governing Board for approval. So a lot of uh, opportunities for your organization and your folks to participate. Uh, this is again uh, where we are now. Uh, March uh, of this month, I believe it's the 24th, is our first stakeholder working group meeting. Um, so. I want to recap the input opportunities because I think that's very important. Um, I already talked about the committees that you all are represented on. For the residents and businesses that aren't a stake in the stakeholder working group or uh, not council members, your I, I called it community dialogue. I think the city manager called it something else. But next Thursday, you're sponsoring an open house. I think that's a tremendous opportunity for you all as representatives of your community to get a lot of input uh, before all of the stakeholder working groups and the technical groups and all that start. The five stakeholder meetings are all public meetings, two open houses. Every time it goes to the TRPA governing board, every time it goes to the TTD board, uh, it's another opportunity, city endorsement meeting as well as the county and TRPA approval meeting. I think I counted a dozen formal public input opportunities uh, over the next 10 months. Um, and obviously, if there's a group that would like us to spend some time with us uh, in a non-public setting, we're happy to spend the time to brief, brief them about it and hear their input and share. Uh, 